at Wells Fargo, you know, there were three very significant mistakes, but there was one that dwarfs all of the others. You're going to have incentive systems at any business, almost any business. There's nothing wrong with incentive systems, but you've got to be very careful what you incentivize. And you can incentivize bad behavior, and if so, you better have a system for recognizing it. Clearly, at Wells Fargo, there was an incentive system built around the idea of cross-selling and number of services per, per uh, customer, and the, the company in every quarterly investor pre presentation highlighted how many services per customer. So it was the focus of the organization, a major focus, and undoubtedly people got paid and graded and promoted based on, on that number, or at least partly based on that number. Well, it turned out that that was incentivizing the wrong kind of behavior. We've made similar mistakes. I mean, any company's gonna make some mistakes in designing a system, uh, but it's a mistake. And you're going to find out about it at some point. And I'll get to how we find out about it. But the biggest mistake was that, and I don't know, obviously I don't know the facts as to how the information got, this, got passed up the line at Wells Fargo. But at some point, uh, if there's a major problem, the CEO will get wind of it. And that is, at that moment, that's the key to everything because the CEO has to act. That Solomon situation that you saw happened because I'm on April, I think 28th, the CEO of Solomon, the president of Solomon, the general counsel of Solomon sat in a room and they had described to them by a fellow named John Merriweather some bad practice, terrible practice that was being conducted by a fellow named Paul Mosier who worked for him. And Paul Mosier was flim flamming the United States Treasury, which is a very dumb thing to do. And he was doing it partly out of spite because they didn't, he didn't like the Treasury and they didn't like him. So he put in phony bids for US Treasuries and all of that. So on April 28th, roughly, uh, the CEO and all these people knew that they had something that had gone very wrong and they had to report it to the Federal Reserve Board in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And the CEO, John, good friend, uh, said he would do it. And then he didn't do it. And he undoubtedly put it off just because it was an unpleasant thing to do. And then on May 15th, another treasury auction was held and Paul Mosher put in a bunch of phony bids again. And at this point, it's all over because the top management had known ahead of time and now a guy that was a pyromaniac had gone out and lit another fire and he lit it after they'd been warned that he was a pyromaniac essentially. And it all went downhill from there. It had to stop when the CEO learns about it. And uh, then they made a third mistake actually, but again, it pales in comparison to the second mistake. They made a third mistake when they totally underestimated the impact of what they had done once it became uncovered because they, there was a penalty of 185 million and in the banking business, people get fined billions and billions of dollars for mortgage practices and all kinds of things. I, the total fines against the big banks, I don't know whether it totals 30 or 40 or billion or whatever the number may be. So they measured the seriousness of the problem by the dimensions of the fine. And they thought a $185 million fine signaled a less offensive practice than something involved two billion and they were totally wrong on that. But the main problem was they didn't act when they learned about it. It was bad enough having a bad system but they didn't act. At Berkshire, uh, we have the main source of information for me about anything that's being done wrong at a subsidiary is the hotline. Now we get 4,000 or so hotline reports or that come, uh, we get communications on the hotline, perhaps 4,000 times uh, a year. And most of them are frivolous. You know, the guy next to me has bad breath or something like that. I mean, it's a, but, but there are, are a few serious ones. And uh, the head of our internal audit, Becky Amick, 
uh, looks at all those people that a lot of them come in anonymous probably most of them uh, and some of them she refers back to the companies probably most of them and but anything that looks re serious you know I will hear about and that has led to action uh, We'll put them more than once, uh, and we we spent real money investigating some of those. We put special investigators sometimes on them, and like I say, it is it is uncovered certain practices that we would not uh, uh, at all condone at the parent company. I think it's it's a good system. I don't think it's perfect. I don't know what I'm sure they've got an internal audit at Wells Fargo, and I'm sure they've got a hotline. And I don't know the facts, but I would just have to bet that a lot of communications came in on that, and I don't know what their system was for, for getting them to the right person, and I don't know who did what at any given time. But that was, it was a huge, huge, huge error if they were getting, uh, and I'm, I'm sure they were, getting some communications and they ignored them or they just sent them back down to somebody down below. Uh, Charlie, uh, you, you followed. What, what, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I put me down as skeptical when some law firm thinks they know how to fix something like this. Yeah. If you're in a business where you have a whole lot of people under incentives very likely to cause a lot of misbehavior, of course you need a big compliance department. Every big wirehouse stock brokerage firm has a huge compliance department, and if we had one, we would have a big compliance department too, wouldn't we, Warren? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that everybody should try and solve their problems with more and more compliance. I think we've had less trouble over the years by being more careful in whom we pick to have power and having a culture of trust. I think we have less trouble, not more. But we will have trouble from time yes, to time. Yes, of course. Yeah. We'll be blindsided someday. Charlie says an ounce of prevention. He said when Ben Franklin, who he worships, uh, said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, he, he, understood, he understated it. That an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. And I would say a pound of cure promptly applied is worth a ton of cure that's delayed. And problems don't go away. John Goodfriend said that problem originally was, uh, what do you, he called it a traffic ticket. He told the troops there at Solomon it was a traffic ticket. You know, and it almost brought down a business. That, uh, uh, some other CEO that they described the problem that he had encountered as a footfall. You know, and it resulted in incredible damage to the institution. And so it, it You've got to, you've got to act promptly. And, and frankly, I don't know any better system than hotlines and anonymous letters. To me, I get anonymous letters, and I've gotten, I've gotten three or four of them, um, probably in the last six or seven years, that have resulted in major changes. And uh, very, very occasionally they're signed. Usually, almost always they're anonymous, but it wouldn't make any difference because. There will be no retribution against anybody, obviously, if they call our attention to something that's going wrong. But I will tell you, as, as we sit here, somebody is doing, quite a few people are probably doing something wrong at Berkshire, and usually it's, it's very limited. I mean, it may be stealing small amounts of money or something like that. But when it gets to some sales practice like was taking place at Wells Fargo, you can see the kind of damage it would do. 